Welcome to Living Well with MS. This podcast comes to you from Overcoming MS, the world's leading multiple sclerosis healthy lifestyle charity, which helps people live a full and healthy life through the Overcoming MS program. We interview a range of experts and people with multiple sclerosis. Please remember, all opinions expressed are their own. Don't forget to subscribe to Living Well with MS on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And now, let's meet our guest. Welcome to the latest edition of the Living Well with MS podcast. Joining me on this edition is a very esteemed guest. We have Dr. Stephen Hauser, who's a neurologist, a neurologist, sorry, and immunologist who currently leads the UCSF Weill Institute for Neurosciences, which I believe is University of California in San Francisco. Um, It's the largest neurosciences institute in the US. He's Harvard educated, he's studied and treated MS extensively for over his um, 50 year career. His work was responsible for the development of B cell therapies for MS, including Ocrelizumab or Ocrevus. He served the Obama administration as a member of the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, and he's the author of the new book, The Face Laughs While the Brain Cries. Um, Check out the show notes for links to that. Dr. Hauser is dedicated to understanding MS and translating that understanding into better answers for people. So welcome, Dr. Hauser. Jeff, good. Uh, Let me start again. (laughs) Can can we, uh, is that all right? That's fine, yeah, carry on. Great. Hello, Jeff. I'm delighted to be here with you and your listeners. Thank you for joining us. So to start off with, uh, that's quite an esteemed career stuff. And I mean, d- dropping um, dropping names like Obama is quite a, quite a good name drop, I would say. Um, so could you introduce yourself um, and tell us a bit about yourself, your work and also your new book? Thank you, Jeff. Delighted to. Um, and thank you for the very kind introduction. As, as you said, I've been a, a researcher in the MS field and in autoimmunity for nearly half a century. I've had great good luck um, as a a scientist, a physician, um, uh, and have spent my career trying to understand the root cause of MS and of other autoimmune diseases. And of course, as a physician to develop more effective therapies. My memoir is called The Face Laughs While the Brain Cries, as you mentioned. I wrote it because I wanted to share a story about medical discovery and tremendous progress against MS. I think that it's a story about faith in science and how science can improve our lives. It also tells real stories of people with MS those afflicted before treatments were available and and after. And another theme is that medical research is just so very fragile. But above all, I hope that the book will increase a little bit the public's interest and confidence in science and also will be engaging and fun to read. When I began my career, there were no treatments for MS, and there was also a pessimism that progress would ever be possible. So it's really quite remarkable that today we can turn off the disease in many people, especially those in whom MS is just beginning. And the prospect of lives free from disability is is a reality today. This is a a magnificent advance and one that was possible because of the efforts of many hundreds of dedicated people working together across boundaries and borders, but especially patients who trusted us and courageously agreed to participate in the clinical trials that are really the only way to test if the ideas from the laboratory are really on track. Yeah, a lot of people from MS say the um, the mice always get the best drugs. Yes. Always first, aren't they? Um, so um, I believe you suffered from a number of allergies, eczema, asthma as a child, so other autoimmune conditions. So could you explain what exactly is autoimmunity 
because we hear this that, that it could all be con- I've heard from another doctor that it could all be connected and there's so many different con- conditions which you're not catching something you're not you know it's not um like covid or something you your your body is doing something to itself so what exactly is autoimmunity and how does it relate to multiple multiple sclerosis and inflammation that we hear about well jeff jeff inflammation is is caused by an activated or turned on immune system the immune system is designed to protect us against invading organisms bacteria viruses fungal infections. In autoimmunity, the immune system turns against the body. It turns against itself. And in MS, the immune system attacks the nervous system, myelin and nerve cells. As many listeners know, normally each nerve cell connects with thousands of others through electrical signals and wires. But when the myelin covering is attacked and it's attacked by the immune system, the nerves can short circuit like frayed power cords. And then over time, connections are lost, nerve cells die and symptoms of brain disease appear. There are autoimmune diseases against every organ in the body. And these are all caused by a misdirected immune response. So uh, do you think, are they connected? I mean, is it likely if you have one, you'd get another? Is your your body hardwired, if you like, to have autoimmunity? I, I don't know if we're hardwired, but there's no question that some of us are more predisposed than others to allergic and autoimmune disease. Some of this is inherited and some of this is due to environment. What we do know is that certain people have family members that are at risk for multiple different autoimmune diseases, not only multiple sclerosis, but illnesses like psoriasis, which is very common in people with MS, an autoimmune disease of skin, thyroid autoimmune disease, also very common in people with MS, and then less often others like diseases of the joint, the autoimmune disease rheumatoid arthritis, or type 1 diabetes, an autoimmune attack on the pancreas. So there are special families where autoimmune diseases occur commonly, And those families have been incredibly important in understanding the inherited factors, the genes that contribute to MS and other autoimmune diseases. So, because my, I've said this many times on this podcast, that my father had MS. Uh, Unfortunately, he died relatively young. Um, He didn't really have treatment at the time. This was in the, you know, he was uh, diagnosed in the late seventies would have been, um, and he died yes. in the late nineties. Um, but also, but I, I, and I think now, well, definitely there's a genetic connection because I know a lot of people with MS who have family members, um, way beyond what would be statistically normal. Um, but also my mother has rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So is that, so potentially that could also be a genetic connection, even though it's not the same condition that, that I could actually be inheriting a form, although I don't have rheumatoid arthritis, it may be that a predisposition for autoimmune conditions might be. There there is no question that inherited factors play some role, but in our larger population, they play a minor, a relatively minor role. Mm through wonderful global collaborations spearheaded in the UK and the United States, working in partnership together, along with colleagues in Australia, many nations in Europe, uh, the genetic architecture of multiple sclerosis has really been identified. Um, And the genes that were most easily found are those that contribute to risk for MS and in some respects to other autoimmune diseases. There are more than 230 
risk genes that contribute to MS uh, of the 23,000 genes that we have in our body. But these, even all together, are probably less important for most people than effects of environment. Okay. Um, so just to change tack a little bit, in, in your book you've written, and I hopefully, hopefully I'll quote this correctly, physicians care for the soul as well as the body, and also you wrote, the purpose of medicine is to treat the person, not the illness. Um, I would say that many people with MS, when they visit their consultants, their neurologists, they would find that it's quite time limited and sometimes lacks personalization. I wouldn't say it's always the case. Um, it does depend where you are. So certainly in the UK, we're very fortunate that we can have amazing healthcare um, at no cost, which is brilliant. So I've had very expensive treatments, which I haven't had to pay for. But on the other hand, my neurologist is certainly very time limited um, and can only see me at most annually and for quite a brief periods of time. He doesn't lack personalization. He's absolutely wonderful. But the nature of his job is he has to be quite brief. He has to see lots of people. Other places, it'll be a different situation. It depends on the healthcare situation. But I think a lot of people find that their consultant might be rushed, might lack personalization. So do you have any tips to um to deal to connect with your neurologist um you know what sort of questions would you have how would you get the most out of your few minutes that you have um potentially just once a year such a difficult and important question um i think first be prepared uh write down perhaps two or three important questions and begin with those questions. Then not questions that are important to perhaps uh, the physician, but those that are important to you. Focus on the problems that are bothering you. Uh, you may well need referrals to experts in different areas to help with rehabilitation or visual or bladder problems. Um, but make sure that the things that you care about are at the top of the agenda. Um, find a physician who cares about you, not only your MS, someone who will be your advocate. It may not be the expert consultant. It may be a general practitioner. For many patients who are receiving highly effective medicines for MS today, MS attacks may be completely prevented, and in some ways, care is simpler than it is in the past. Um, I think a focus on treating symptoms becomes so important and on guiding uh, decisions that have important consequences to one's life. So I think the value of the interaction, the face-to-face -face interaction with caregivers is so important. And finding physicians and therapists who care about you and can help you, uh, I think is key. Sometimes if you are interested in joining a clinical study, that could be a way to have additional time with experts while you're helping the effort for not only yourself, but for hopefully many, many others. I have heard that. I mean, it, it does somewhat depend on where you live, but certainly in the UK, if you're near a large population center um, and, and can take part in a trial, I've, people I've um, spoken to who've been on trials, they just said it was like having the most like bespoke, pristine healthcare system that you could ever afford. Um, you know, they were they were getting endless tests, checkups. People, but they were you know they were genuinely interested because partly they probably were anyway, but also because it mattered for their research. So suddenly they became it, it became that they were in, their 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 condition was important for the researcher. It was, and they just said the treatment was amazing. 
Um, even if you were given the, the placebo, which they don't know, but they, they said even if you were just given a placebo, you'll get amazing treatment for a, the, the period of time. In, in, in my career, uh, Jeff, the joys of medicine uh, have been amplified by the time that we have to really interact with people um, because we are both researchers and clinicians. And by bringing both worlds together, um, I think relationships are, are built. Uh, so it's been one of the joys of medicine for me. There are also ethical challenges whenever a caregiver is also a scientist and transparency, um, looking in the mirror, asking for outside advice frequently uh, is so important because even in a clinical research environment, the, the interests of the patient has to come first. Um, and could I ask a bit about other um, autoimmune brain conditions? So how does MS, how is it similar to, how is it different from other, other, other conditions rather, such as Parkinson's or autism? You know, are there similarities between them or are they completely distinct? Well, um, I, I've thought a lot about this because as, as you may know from uh, my book, I was surrounded as a youngster by brain diseases. Autism is present from early childhood. It's a horrible condition for patients and loved ones often, um, but one gets used to it um, often in a, in a family circle. Parkinson's begins late in life, also a very difficult time. But MS is different. It strikes just as our lives are beginning to blossom. Teenage years, early adulthood. Um, it also presents uncertainty that many people feel is just as big a problem as the MS itself. Will my MS be disabling or just a nuisance? Uh, should I change my career plans? What about my marriage plans? Should I tell my folks? What about my boyfriend? How should I think about my future? For all these reasons, I, I think MS can be a particularly cruel and, and unfair disease. Um. I mean, although I would say, because I, I know a number of people with Parkinson's, um, and I think there's been huge leaps forward in terms of treatment for people with MS. Yes. Whereas other conditions like Parkinson's, they do seem to be, I, I'm sure that they're saying, oh, well, they, we keep hearing there'll be a breakthrough in five years, and but they seem to be, they haven't had that breakthrough that we kind of had maybe 10 years ago where it started to, suddenly get lots of things on in the pipeline now they do seem to, there's a huge range of choices now if you go to your neurologist i think part of the job actually when if you someone who's newly newly diagnosed is actually doing a lot of research because there might be a whole load of um treatments they are offered which yeah i do think that with parkinson's especially it does seem to be a hopefully they'll get more treatment soon I, I think that the wonderful advances against MS are hopefully the beginning uh, of an era that we will see in the near future where there will be better treatments, repairs, preventions, cures for the billion people each year who develop a brain disease. Hopefully so. Uh, Advances so like those in MS make government and industry more optimistic that brain diseases can be treated effectively through modern science and cl proper clinical trials. There was uncertainty uh, if 
brain diseases were just too complicated. They're more complicated than cardiovascular diseases or cancer. But in 2023, that has changed. And there are enormous efforts underway to find answers. And with advances in science, Parkinson's disease has become simpler to understand and hopefully in the near future, simpler to treat. Um, one of the things that's particularly um, been in the news lately is the role of infection um, in MS. So they're saying there's, they're almost certain that there's a connection with Epstein-Barr virus. So um, what is the role of infections? Because we've got an autoimmune condition, rather, it's not a you know, we don't have something that's that's directly reacting. You know, it's not it's not necessarily caused by um, a disease that we have. But is there a role of, of infection in brain diseases like MS? Uh, there is no question that infection is a very important part of understanding the mystery not only of MS, but of all other autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases have almost certainly increased dramatically in modern societies, even though the historical record is difficult to follow. Um, our societies have also changed dramatically uh, over time. And because of that, we, are, we come into contact with viruses and bacteria at different times in our lives and in different ways than we did in the past. When it's working right, our immune system is formed, it's sculpt sculpted. We say in immunology terms, the immune system is educated by the bacterial and viral particles that are all around us and in our bodies. And one purpose of this immune education is to remove cells that also react against normal tissues in the body. And just like school, education is most effective early in life. So we think that infection, especially when it's encountered later in life, can trigger a misdirected immune response in MS against myelin and other brain substances. So it could be that our focus on hygiene could set the stage for an increased risk for autoimmune diseases in general, and MS specifically. And there is very strong evidence that one of those factors in MS, as you say, could be a later exposure to Epstein-Barr virus than our immune system ideally intended uh, that to be. So we're actually, by overly being overly hygienic, especially with children or babies, then actually that in itself is ne not necessarily a good thing. And maybe when you say, no, don't play in the dirt, that's exactly what your kids should be doing is a little bit. I mean, obviously, it's a difficult one, isn't it? You, you, there, you need to be hygienic, but also maybe actually playing in the dirt is not a bad thing for kids or you know, I, they, I, they need to pick up a few bugs. I have written about this in, in the face laughs because it, it, uh, in my own experience, uh, uh, played such an important role as I reared my own children and my focus on hygiene with my oldest child, as many parents do, may be, um, may have been an incorrect focus that is not necessarily, um, a good thing. It's worth remembering that we're a pretty young species, human beings. We're 7,000 generations or 180,000 years um, old. And until 10,000 years ago, we were living in hunter-gatherer groups of no more than 10 or 20 people, sharing the germs of very few people who were often related to us. And then about 10,000 years ago, came animal husbandry and farming. And now some people could feed others. 
in larger numbers. And then came cities and giant cities and technology. And we are now living in a very different kind of environment than our immune system uh, had um, developed expecting. So uh, modern society may in some uh, respects be responsible for the uh, increase in several autoimmune diseases that we've seen, including MS. Um, so you mentioned you've written a book. So um, would it be possible um, for you to read a short passage from your book? Absolutely. I'd be delighted to, Jeff. Um, maybe a, as, a, as a prelude, um, I tell the story in the book about the development of treatment targeting a very minor cell in the immune system called a B cell. Uh, this is a cell that can make a chemical bullet called an antibody, but can also direct other immune cells to turn on or to turn off. And the development of treatments that would target this cell, this B cell, was really a paradigm shift for the field. Um, but it was based on years uh, of very solid research and preliminary evidence. But nonetheless, the approach was quite unconventional and had many naysayers. So one portion of the book describes the first moment when we saw the results of the initial clinical trial to test if B-cell treatment might be effective against MS. And I'll um, I, think you, yeah, I think your book might be picking up a little bit of microphone noise. I don't know if it's near. I can hear a noise, I think, of fluttering. Should I start this again? Um, no, that bit was fine. I just, no, if it, I mean, okay, if it's I was near... putting it on top of the de the computer. That's why it did it. Oh, that'd be why. <laughs> yeah. So I'll. I'll I mean, yeah, it. you could do, you could do a re yeah. You, I mean, if you're happy yeah. to do a re yeah, do that again. Why don't I start it again? And just give me one sec. It's allergy season in yeah. <laughs> San Francisco. The same here. So I'll ask you the question again. And then the next yes, one. that's great. So um, we've mentioned that you've got a, a new book out. Um, would it be possible for you to read us a short passage from your book? I'd be delighted to. And might begin by describing the context of, of this section. The development of treatment targeting a, an unusual type of white blood cell, a B cell, would be a paradigm shift for the field of MS, research and care. B cells are a type of lymphocyte, a white blood cell, that can make chemical bullets called antibodies and can also direct other cells of the immune system to turn on or turn off. So the idea that B cells might be involved in MS was quite unconventional, but it was based on years of research and very solid evidence. But it was still going against the grain of the field and had many naysayers. So in this section, I'll describe what happened on an August afternoon in 2006 when we opened or unblinded the results of the first preliminary clinical study to see if killing B cells in the bloodstream could have any effect on multiple sclerosis. This was the moment that changed everything. Today, we would unblind the results of our first study, treating MS with a B-cell antibody, 
we'd see if the treatment worked. It was a miracle that we made it this far. The cards were stacked against us. Most everyone, including the federal government, were convinced that T lymphocytes, not B lymphocytes, were the villains in MS. B cells were the good guys, they said. Kill them off with your treatment and you'll make MS worse. That's what happens in mice. If our treatment does the same to people, we could hurt them. So needless to say, when we unblinded the trial on that late August afternoon, the stakes were high. And when we opened the folder containing the results, what we saw was extraordinary. There was a nearly complete and almost immediate elimination of inflammation in our treated patients. And improvement was already evident on the first MRI scan taken just four weeks after treatment as a precautionary safety measure, added to be sure that by removing B cells, we did not make MS worse. By the next MRI, eight weeks later, MRI activity was reduced by more than 90%, a positive effect that was sustained throughout the duration of the study. There were also big reductions in new MS attacks, which was amazing because the study was so small. But most stunning was the rapid onset of action. Because the benefit appeared almost immediately, it could not have been due to a reduction in disease-causing antibodies, as this would have taken much longer to occur. The only reasonable explanation was that the B cells themselves were at the heart of MS. Nature had revealed one of its closely guarded secrets, how the brain was attacked. The program leader at Genentech, the company that sponsored the trial, with whom I'd worked arm in arm, who rode shotgun to make sure we could stay on course despite the obstacles, whose career was on the line with this one, could not contain her tears a mixture of relief, exhaustion, and joy. We discovered an incredibly potent, effective, and apparently safe new treatment. And was this what ultimately became Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab? Yes, yeah, so this was with an earlier drug called Rituximab. Mm -hmm. And we then went forward to develop a more modern drug with more favorable, attractive characteristics uh, called ocrelizumab or ocrevis, and subsequently another called ofatumumab uh, that has been uh, recently, uh, several years now, um, in uh, general use. And how, how is that process? How do you go about developing the drugs that you, so you you've identified the target and then how do you actually look into developing a drug to target the b cells that are causing the problem well it um it was very fortunate that the discoveries were made at the time when the biotechnology industry was at its birth and it was extraordinarily um, uh, lucky that the first monoclonal antibody therapy that was ever approved by the FDA, by the Federal Food and Drug Administration in the United States, uh, was a treatment that killed malignant B cells in patients with B cell cancers, a disease called lymphoma. So there was a ready-made drug for uh, us to try. And there were so many aspects of the story that were unexpected. That was why I called it a miracle. One of the parts of the miracle was that the drug happened to have been developed by my college roommate. And it was our friendship that helped us at critical times get through um, many points along the journey where uh, this could have stopped. 
we had wanted to test rituximab while we were developing the better drugs, but for numerous reasons that would not prove feasible. And I, I still am disappointed that we were never able to fully develop rituximab as an approved treatment for MS, because it is clearly uh, quite effective. Um, and where does it go f next? So, what, so is, there, is there more and what's next in B-cell research in MS? Um, I think one principle of all modern trials, and especially those for MS, is that we learn as much about disease by the effects of our treatments as by any experiment in the laboratory. But it's only by bringing these two worlds together where the most dramatic progress can be made. And this is certainly the case in the MS story. The dramatic effectiveness of B cells resulted in a reevaluation of the basic biology of MS, along with how other therapies against MS might be working. And with this new focus on B cells as a critical player in the MS disease cascade, it now became clear that B cells that were hiding in protected areas just outside of the brain in an area called the meninges and around blood vessels in the brain, that these B cells were there and were resistant to probably all of our treatments because they couldn't reach the B cells in these areas and that they were making chemicals and communicating with other immune cells in a way that was driving slow degeneration of cells of the nervous system, myelin and nerve cells and causing neurodegeneration and causing progression. So there is now a very sharp focus on developing therapies that will eliminate these residual B cells that are hiding um, uh, in and near the brain and that are driving progressive MS. So I am extremely optimistic that current trials focused on remedi remediating progression, alleviating progression are going to be successful. And perhaps the treatments are in two areas. The first are uh, to treat more aggressively at the beginning of MS before these B cells and other cells move into the nervous system where they are resistant to treatment. So if we treat at the dawn of disease more effectively, can we cure the disease? And second, for people who already have had MS for a number of years, there are treatments now in therapeutic trials that we hope can eliminate those B cells that are residing in the nervous system and that current treatments cannot reach. I think we're moving towards a point in MS care where we will treat very aggressively at the beginning of the disease in patients who wish to have this sort of treatment treatments with highly effective therapies like B-cell therapies, like alemtuzumab, like natalizumab or tisabri. And that after induction of a remission, we will then either maintain with a less aggressive treatment or stop treatment and monitor and develop biomarkers that will tell us if and when retreatment is necessary. So I think we're moving to a whole new concept of how to treat MS and other autoimmune diseases that is a little bit like cancer uh, therapies, where we will induce a complete remission and then maintain and monitor that remission. And when we can declare victory 
is the great question. When is there a cure and what do we mean by a cure? In some forms of B-cell cancer, for example, and cancer is not multiple sclerosis, but in B-cell cancer, if all evidence of the disease is gone for three years, then the lifetime risk of it ever recurring is less than 1%. That could be the kind of goal that we could have for people with MS. That would be fantastic. It's, it's very optimistic what you're saying as well. I think that uh, gives a lot of people hope. Um, just to change track, so Overcoming MS is a, it's, um, a program which is it's largely lifestyle modification. It does include um, disease-modifying therapy, um, where appropriate. So we're not a, an anti-disease modifying therapy um, approach at all. Um, but it also encourages lifestyle changes. So looking at diet, exercise, mindfulness, um, alongside disease, disease modifying therapies. So what would be, I, I mean, firstly, um, do you think lifestyle has a, a factor with the course of MS? And secondly, would you have any tips for for lifestyle modifications for people who have MS? Lifestyle is, uh, is so important for all of us. Um, uh, and I think especially for people with overactive immune systems and people with MS. Um, a healthy lifestyle is key. Uh, it can have a huge effect. A regular balanced diet, adequate sleep is as important as anything else. Our immune system changes dramatically when our sleep is too short or interrupted. I'm a big believer in exercise and in doing things that you love to do. Find the path that makes you optimistic and self-confident despite having MS. These can have huge um, advantages to people. I don't believe in focusing so much on all of these things that you withdraw from life and aspiring to make big accomplishments in the world, but being in tune with your body and your needs and being as healthy as you can is enormously helpful. That is fantastic advice. And I think firstly, I would encourage everyone um, to uh, check out the show notes and, and there'll be links in there to the face laughs while the brain cries. Um, because I did, I have seen um, an edition of that and it is, um, as you say, it's an entertaining book as well as an educational book. So it's um, it it's uh, it's not a boring read, um, but you learn a lot of information while having having a, an enjoyable read as well. So um, I think well worth checking out um, the book. And um, just to thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Living Well with MS, Dr. Stephen Hauser. Thank you so much, Jeff. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Living Well with MS. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast. You'll find useful links and bonus information there. Have questions or ideas to share? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. Or you can reach out to Jeff on Twitter at Jeff Alex. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time for tips on living a full and happy life with MS.